Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. If you stand, I'll be reading verses 5 through 12. Matthew 16, verses 5 through 12, as we continue to uh, follow the ministry of our Lord Jesus, and particularly as he comes in increasing conflict with the uh, religious leaders, with those around him, uh, and his, his, his responses to them. Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 5. And the disciples came to the other side of the sea, but they had forgotten to bring any bread. And Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They began to discuss this among themselves, saying, he said that because we did not bring any bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, you men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets full you picked up? Or the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets full you picked up? How is it that you do not understand that I do not speak to you concerning bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not, speak, he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Please be seated. Now, when I was a, a youth intern under my mentor, Rocky Wyatt, way back in the 1980s, I was tasked to drive one of the vehicles as we took a group of junior high students to Yellowstone for summer camp. Now, it was a long drive, and Rocky emphasized to us that we were on a tight schedule in order to make it there in time to set up camp and get everything ready for the day. Well, after stopping for gas somewhere in the wilds of Wyoming, I managed to take the wrong on-ramp back onto the freeway and ended up going the opposite direction from our destination. Everyone else had managed to take the right exit. Now, to make matters worse, there was serious road construction going on, and several of the exits were closed, and that meant that I had to drive almost 20 miles before I could even get off the freeway and head back the other way. Of course, this meant about an hour delay, while the rest of the caravan just sat and waited for me to return. Now, you can imagine my mounting anxiety as I drove up to the group and saw Rocky, the youth pastor, out of the car looking maybe just a tad impatient. Uh, well, I didn't want to deal with my failure. I, in my proud embarrassment, just pulled up into the back of the line, and I had one of the teens go up and tell Rocky, hey, everything's fine, uh, let's just keep moving. Now, I watched him, and after a moment's hesitation, as he kind of looked my direction, he got back in the car, and we finished the drive to Yellowstone. But as you can imagine, that evening, I had to face the music. So Rocky took me aside, and he took me to task, not so much for making the mistake in driving, although he wasn't pleased at my inattention, but more so with my pride that I was unwilling to come and talk things out after making my mistake. And we're going to see a mistake that the disciples make in our text. And how we respond to mistakes and failures in the Christian life is going to play a huge factor in how much we grow as believers. We will certainly never live a day without making mistakes. It is how we respond to our Lord, how we run to him when we both make mistakes that are not sinful and then we make sinful mistakes. How we respond to those things will really be the measure of how we grow in our Christian life. See, it's very easy to get distracted by our needs and even to be distracted by our failures. Perhaps our failures distract us even more than our needs. And when we are distracted, when we lose sight of God's provision in the midst of those things, then we become spiritually vulnerable we worry about the temporal. We worry about our own egos. We worry about all of our own failings, and we refuse and, and have a difficulty responding by faith. So what we'll see this morning is we must continually cultivate a deeper faith in Christ and his word so that we are not lured away by the deadly dangers of false teaching. Because you see, at just the moment where we begin to focus on ourselves, we then become vulnerable to teaching that will draw us away from Christ. So again, we must continually cultivate a deeper faith in Christ and his word so that we are not lured away by the deadly dangers of false teaching. Spiritual stability requires growing faith. Now in chapter 16, we have seen Jesus return back to the land of, of Israel, essentially, beginning on the east side of the Lake of Galilee, ministering to the Gentiles and, and, and continuing to pour out his grace upon them, overflowing, really, the, the blessings and benefits to Israel to the Gentiles. And he goes back and he ministers to the crowd. We saw that. We saw him teach the crowd and heal the crowd. And this amazes them as the blind are seeing and the lame are walking. The mute are speaking, and uh, really a preview of the kingdom as Jesus heals one and all. And then he feeds them in his great compassion. We saw 
that he was, he was desirous that they wouldn't even trip or fall on the way home, being tired because of, or weak because of a lack of food. But his compassion extended all the way down to the depth of their physical need. From spiritual needs to physical needs, Jesus desired to meet them all. He was compassionate towards every realm of our lives. This is the way that we are to live as well. We too are to have this kind of compassion. And what we saw then as he makes this, this provision for 4,000 uh, men, which included uh, probably as many as uh, 10 to 15,000 people altogether, he again feeds them. And remember that this is all to a group of people who do not worship him as the Messiah. They are looking for his physical gifts, his physical blessings, but they're not responding to him spiritually. And I wonder if as you had your Thanksgiving meals, my guess is that most of you, perhaps all of you, certainly were sitting around the table thanking God for spiritual provisions. But I wonder if you recognize how really unusual that is even in our own country. Or people will sit around and they might even take some time to be thankful for the physical blessings that they have received, but they really have no ability to be thankful for what is going on spiritually. And, and perhaps you even sat with family members who really were, were kind of like, can we move past the Thanksgiving part? We, we didn't want to get to the food. And then we want to get to the football or, or whatever it might have been, as opposed to the whole focus being on what? The blessings that our Lord has given us, yes, physically, but much more so and in a more eternal way, the eternal blessings of salvation in Christ. This is a precious privilege that we have to be able to thank God in this way for these unbelievable blessings that he has provided us with. He is the great provider, the compassionate provider. Physically, yes, but most importantly and eternally, spiritually. And we saw that great provision all within the context of Jesus' preparations to make spiritual provision for the people. Remember, he is on his way now out of Israel for a brief period of time again and then back to Jerusalem to be crucified, to die, to be buried, to rise again on behalf of this sinful people and certainly on behalf of us. So the king then was, uh, he, he, he fed the multitudes, and then he goes back across the lake, we remember, and there waiting for him is this group of scribes, excuse me, of Pharisees and Sadducees. We saw last week that this particular grouping, what was, we didn't see them before, last time was Matthew chapter 3, when the Pharisees and Sadducees tried to come to John the Baptist and be baptized. And he said, you brood of vipers, you don't have any desire to repent, why are you here? Well, in this case, all the way now in Matthew 16, the Pharisees and Sadducees are not the least bit interested in repentance. That's far done. They're not even making a show of repentance. The only thing they're trying to do is to, is to remove the people's love for Jesus and following of Jesus so that they can discredit him as the Messiah, so that they maintain their own power. We saw that in, in chapter 16, verse 1. When the Pharisees and Sadducees came up, testing Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Say, look. If you are truly the Messiah, show us something impressive. Now, he just fed 15,000 people. But really, they're, the way they're making the comparison, they look, we want to see something really impressive. Maybe like what Moses did in the wilderness. Moses fed millions of people, as many as two million of the sons of Israel in the wilderness. So that's a real sign from God. Moses is more impressive than you. That's kind of behind these things. Show us a real sign from heaven, something that only God can do. This feeding, you know, 15,000 people, this providing, uh, you know, healing everyone, that's not sufficient for us. We want more. And remember that we said last week that seeing is not believing. They had seen sign after sign, miracle after miracle. Jesus had been doing this for two and a half years, literally emptying hospitals. And because of their arrogant, proud self-righteousness, because they believed they were already spiritually sufficient, they totally set aside the ministry of Christ, overlooking even the signs that he performed to demonstrate his Messiah, that he was Messiah, to demonstrate the power of God. They totally overlooked those because they were hard-hearted spiritually. They refused to bend the knee to Jesus. And this is always how it will be. Until there's a willingness to recognize the nature of our own sinfulness and our need, and then to bend the knee to the only one who can make provision, it doesn't matter how many signs, how many, how many reasons, how, how much you see, you will not respond. We must respond to the Messiah. And, and Jesus rebuked their evil. He called them an evil and adulterous generation. He says, you seek for a sign. He says, but I'm not going to give you a sign. Remember, he'd given them all kinds of signs. He'd shown all kinds of demonstrations of his power. He says, but, but those, aren't, those are not the signs that you need in order to recognize my salvation. What you need is what? The sign of Jonah. And as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, as he then came out of that fish and preached a message of repentance to the people, 
and, and really the people of Nineveh repented. So Jesus, in the earth, as it were, for three days, uh, then rises from the grave, and now we have the preaching of repentance to all the nations to believe in the Messiah. That's the sign. The sign is Jesus. And after saying, you will receive only the sign of Jonah, he then walks again out of the country, leaving the scribes and, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees kind of open-mouthed, again having been thwarted, again having been shown to be completely inadequate to try to, to deal with the wisdom and the power of Jesus. He leaves the country essentially only to return again in order to provide their very salvation. So let's pick it up now. After this confrontation with the Pharisees and Sadducees, let's see what the disciples are thinking. And this is just such, it's such a fascinating passage, a little, almost a little aside into the life of the disciples, into Jesus' interactions with them. And I hope that it will teach us a lot about ourselves. So first we'll see that the disciples, much like us, are forgetful. Right, so in verse 5, Matthew points this out. The disciples came to the other side of the sea, but they had forgotten to bring any bread. So the disciples are forgetful. They travel across the lake, and you notice it says the disciples. Well, I think we certainly would understand that Jesus is with them, but well, we're not focusing on Jesus here. We're focusing, Matthew is focusing on the nature of the disciples and Jesus' interactions with them. So it says the disciples came. Jesus was with them. He was in the boat. We know that from Matthew chapter 8, or from Mark chapter 8. Right, so they get to the other side, and they had forgotten to bring any bread. Now, again, this is fascinating. They just had bread provided for them. And they just, Jesus had just fed uh, ten to 15,000 people. Large baskets of bread had been picked up. They then come back across the lake. It's probably not a large amount of time. And they probably had some of that bread even left over. But somehow, in the hurry to get on the boat, they left the baskets behind. In fact, Mark chapter 8, verse 14 says, they'd forgotten to take any bread. They did not have more than one loaf in the boat with them. So there's the 12 disciples, maybe more, Jesus himself, sitting there with one loaf of bread. And now they're hungry. Right? So Jesus, just, he just fed all the other crowd. He provided a, an abundance of, remember, the seven large baskets. And now again, they're without bread because they failed. They just forgot to take the bread. And who knows who was assigned? You know, it's Philip. Philip, bring the baskets of bread. They hop on the boat, they're in a hurry, they head to the other side, and they're like, Philip, hey, wh where's the bread? Sorry, <laughs> forgot it. He's holding the one loaf, maybe. Uh, this is all I got. I forgot everything else. And, and so they're, they're realizing, okay, now we're hungry, now we don't have any food, so what are we going to do? And, and just on the side here, the disciples were fallible human beings just like who? Us. Now, we know that, but I think Again, I think sometimes we look at Scripture, and although we'll look at the disciples and say, yeah, they failed, and they failed at times, we still somehow are surprised by our own failings. Or, or maybe, not surprised, but we're still far too proud to admit our failings. We, we don't want to admit that we fail. And it surprises us every time because we constantly, perhaps, are, are, are thinking that in our abilities and our, our, our own strength, we're able to accomplish things that we cannot is they just forgot the stuff. They forgot the food. Now, you might have heard the, the, the Michael Jordan commercial. It's somewhat famous. And it shows, him, shows a shot of him. He's shooting baskets. Michael Jordan plays basketball, in case you're not f tracking along with me there. But, uh, so he's a basketball, was a basketball player. Very famous. Right? Uh, perhaps the greatest basketball player of all time, some would say. But yet you hear this voice behind the commercial as he's, as he's making these shots and playing basketball. It says this, I've missed more than 900 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life, and that is why I succeed. You know, and you feel kind of Nike. You're like, oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I succeed. Or, or, or failure is success. And you go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fail like Michael Jordan. And, and then you, but you start to go out and you think, wait a minute. Wait a minute, I could shoot the same shots that he shot a hundred times. I, every time I was given the winning shot, I would lose. Not 26. It would be every time. I would lose all the games. Why? Because my skill is, is worthless when it comes to basketball. See, Michael Jordan can say, I kept trying and kept trying because he was incredibly skillful. See, it's a bait and switch. It's like, hey, yeah, go out and, go out and fail and you'll succeed. Well, not if you don't have any talent. You're just going to continue to fail. I mean, you could walk out on the basketball court and you would fail every single time. So when you start to think about it, you're like, wait a minute. That sounded all emotional and it sounded all great, but I just fail. I'm just a failure. I don't have any talent. I don't have any ability. What do they say? Uh, winners never quit. Quitters never win. But if you never win and never quit, you're just a fool. Think about that one for a minute. You guys, the disciples failed a lot. In fact, 
we fail a lot and we probably fail more. What does that have to say about us? That we are failures. And if you want to go out and say, I'll just do better and I'll do better tomorrow and I'll pick it up and because I failed, I'll succeed. That's just foolish. Failure's failure. Unless you are supremely talented. Well, we have the precious privilege of what? Being united to the one as believers who has all talent, all giftedness, all strength, all power. Yes, you can fail and then succeed because you are united to the one who never failed. That's your only hope. Your, only, your hope is not in your, well, I'm just such a failure and I'll figure it out eventually like Michael Jordan. No, your only hope is that you're never gonna figure it out. You'll continue to fail until you have faith in Jesus, until you believe in him, until you rest in him and trust in him. And that's what Jesus is gonna try to teach the disciples here. That's what he was teaching them all along the way. Your failures, own it and trust in me. Have faith. Believe who I am. Believe what I said. Remember my provision. Understand that you, on your own, cannot do this at all. You forget the bread. That's who we are. We just forget the bread. Everywhere we go, every time we try to do something, we're just like the disciples with failures. The Lord is gracious to us. Is he not in the midst of that? Psalm 103, verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Some mistakes are just mistakes. They're not necessarily sinful. Most of our mistakes come from some kind of sin. (laughs) But we, we're proud, we're arrogant, we're foolish, we, we're inattentive. But the Lord is gracious. He's removed our transgressions. But I, I love the rest of that passage in Psalm 103. He doesn't just remove it you know, from us because, well, in some kind of judicial action, he says, all right, I'll take away your sin. I don't like you very much, but my son died for you, and so I don't have any choice. I'll, you know, I'll remove your sin. I'm stuck. No, he says, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Those who honor him and love him and are in awe of him who recognize what he's done and completely unlike the Pharisees and Sadducees, but like the disciples who did recognize Jesus, who did understand who he was, or at least were beginning to have that glimmering of understanding. They had a fear of him. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he, I love this part, for he himself knows our frame. He knows how you were built. He built you. He put you together. Why do you think, or somehow do you think it surprises him when you fail? When he's the one who put you together. He knows what you're like. He knows you're in a fallen world. He knows all the things that are going on. And somehow you think he's surprised by that? No, he knows our frame. He's mindful that we are but dust. That's all we are. He made us that way. As for man, his days are like grass, a flower of the field so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it's no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. If it was just us, we're just dust. From, from dust we were made, from dust we shall return. It's all over. The wind blows, the flowers are gone, and there's nothing left except the last part of that verse. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children. He's the one who lasts. He's the one who perseveres. He's the one who sustains us in the midst of all of our failures. We would just pass from the scene and be done, never even to be remembered except Michael Jordan for a couple of years. But in Christ, because he is forever and his righteousness forever and his his compassion is forever, when we are total failures, In fact, in our total failure, he is the one who succeeds. The disciples were failures, but they had a great God, one who made full provision for them and one who makes full provision for us. So we see the disciples are forgetful. They just forgot the bread. And and, and now they're they're gonna be warned. Jesus is gonna warn them. This is so fascinating. So remember, we're, we're, they're just coming off this confrontation with the Pharisees and Sadducees. They've gotten so out of sorts that they forget the bread. They have no food, and they're hungry, I think is the implication. They've gone across the lake, right, and now they don't have anything to eat. And Jesus takes this moment, again, to, to, give, to bring a theological lesson. He always seems in the middle of physical difficulties. Now, now mark this. This is not an accident. In the midst of physical difficulty and struggle, even their own failure, Jesus is always bringing some kind of theological point. Remember, remember the woman, the, the woman of great faith, whose daughter was being ravaged by a demon? He stops in the middle of that, and he gives a, a theological lesson. Why? Because everything about our lives relates to the theological. That is how we understand and respond to God. Everything. And if you don't view your life that way, you're missing your whole life. 
You, you will always be confused. You will always be frustrated. You will always be discouraged if you don't view everything in light of who God is, what he's done, and how you are to relate to him. We call that theology. The study of God, but it's never apart from his relationship to man and the way that we are able to enter into and receive from his blessings and from his presence. So again, he's gonna give them a little lesson. And Jesus said to them, he's gonna give them a warning, watch out and beware. By the way, this is very strong. These are commands. It's almost like, you know, they get off the boat. They've got no bread. They're all frustrated about that. And Jesus is like, you're missing the point. We're gonna see who cares about the bread. You better watch out for the false teaching of that group that we just left. Because this will kill you. I mean, it's very strong. It's almost like out of the blue. So they hop off the boat. They've got no bread. Jesus turns and says, whoa, hey, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, let's just take a moment on this. Right? The word again, very strong. These are present imperative commands. You better watch out. You better be careful. When he gives these kind of, this kind of language, it means what? There's danger. There's a problem. There's something that could harm you. That, those are the words, watch out and beware. You have to be on the alert or you'll be overcome and harmed by this particular, well, by, by, the, by the danger that he's presenting. And he calls it the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, this might, I think rightfully so, be a little bit confusing. What's he talking about? Leaven. Right now, without taking a lot of time on it, just generally understand that in the Old Testament and then moving into the New, leaven was generally presented as something which was negative or had a, had a bad influence. Remember, leaven goes into bread, and then it, it really works its way all throughout the bread, what? To cause it to rise, it yeast. And so it causes the bread to rise. It, it permeates the entire lump of dough, even just a little bit of leaven. So they would take some from, from each time they, they, they baked, they would take a little bit of the bread that had risen with the yeast in it, they would keep it, keep it back, because you couldn't go to Walmart and get leaven. Right? They, would, they would keep it, and then the next batch of bread, they would put that pinch in there, and it would, it would go permeate throughout the loaf, and then they would keep perpetuating that. They would even spread it around in, the, in, their, uh, uh, in their cities, in their towns, much like the friendship bread that some, some of you might have been part, partaking of. You take a little bit of it, and you pass it on to a friend, and they put it in their loaf, and it moves on. Well, that's leaven. It permeates. The idea is that it has a, a, a permeating influence. It influences everything it touches, and generally in scripture, that influence when it's talking about leaven is negative. In Leviticus 2, when he's talking about the offerings, he says, look, don't bring anything with leaven. In the Passover, when they're leaving, he says, look, cook your bread without leaven. This is unleavened bread. No time for it to rise. You're going to have to get out of the country. And then moving into the New Testament, again, leaven, except in nearly every time except for one or two, is negative. 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Paul says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? That's speaking about sin in the church. And they were boasting. They were actually saying, look how gracious we are to allow really this gross sin of immorality that was going on in the church. Look how gracious we are to, to show blessing and favor to this one who is sinning. Look how Christian we are. He said, it's just the opposite. That sin is killing you. And that, that mindset of sin is going to spread all throughout your congregation and is going to destroy it. He says, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are, in fact, unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. Again, referencing that unleavened bread. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven or with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So Jesus is using a metaphor. The leaven is not actually leaven. It is what? As we will see, it is the teaching of the scribes and Pharisees, and Jesus often used, used metaphors. Now, again, lest we be confused by this, Please understand that properly interpreting scripture will help us to understand these metaphors. We have a literal, grammatical, historical, and contextual hermeneutic, which, which says when you look at language, you take the language the way that it was meant to the original audience. Sometimes it is just simply the words mean exactly that. The leaven means the leaven for bread. If, it's, if you look in the context and see that the leaven is not bread, well, then what might it be? And you look in your context. Well, in our context, it's directly explained. They figure out it's actually teaching. So in a proper hermeneutic, you're always able to, dis to discern whether it's, a, whether it's a metaphor, whether it's, it's plain language. And you don't, need to add any, you don't need to add a typological interpretation or a Christological interpretation. Your literal, grammatical, historical, contextual hermeneutic will always demonstrate to you what kind of language is being used. And that's very important when you read anything. You have to know what the language is. But if you, if, you, if you assume it is something else without carefully looking at all the words in the context, you're going to get confused. Well, 
we get to see this whole thing, right? We have the whole narrative here. The disciples didn't. And they heard the word 11 of the Pharisees and they were consumed with their failure, consumed with what had just happened, and they missed the metaphor completely. Now, they should have gotten it, as we'll see. We'll discuss that. They should have known it, much like us. And by the way, if you read Scripture wrongly, you will end up in serious trouble as well. If you don't understand how to properly interpret it, if you're caught up in your own problems, or you're coming from bringing your own perspective to bear and not properly hearing and interpreting the words of Scripture, you will end up in serious trouble, just like the disciples did. They were consumed with themselves, consumed with their own failure, and they totally missed what Jesus was saying. He's giving them a very strong warning. Look, we just left this group, the Pharisees and Sadducees. He knows that the disciples themselves, it would seem, are still under the influence of this teaching. They still, I mean, they grew up under it. Remember, they're constantly coming to Jesus and saying, did you know you, you, you insulted the scribes and Pharisees? They're mad at you. You, know, they, you might get in trouble with them. They still had a huge weight to bear on the people and even on the disciples. And Jesus is saying, look, you must not be influenced by their self-righteousness. We'll, we'll look at that in just a minute. By their hypocrisy. He knew that they were still in danger of really falling back underneath the seduction of the, the system that the Pharisees and Sadducees were teaching. And this is always true. We always need to be careful that we don't get drawn into false teaching. And this will happen to us when we lack faith in the truth of the word of God, when we are unable to properly discern what it means, and when we're caught up in ourselves so that we overlook the truth just as the disciples are about to do. Because the disciples at first here are clueless. The disciples were warned. Jesus uses this metaphor, and they totally miss it. Right? The disciples are clueless. They began to discuss the statement. So this is the statement discussed. So back in our text, it says they, they began to discuss this statement among themselves. Now that's interesting. They, they didn't include Jesus in this discussion. Right? So this is verse 7. Right? So he says this to them, this strong warning. It's like they kind of gather back together. I don't know where Jesus went. <laughs> but they're all kind of gathered around. They're like, hey, let's huddle. What does he mean by this? Okay, so they were talking about it. Why does Jesus choose? Why, does he, why is he telling us this now? He must have some kind of agenda. Right? He must be, what is this leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees? We don't even get it. Now, I would say here that if they didn't understand, which they clearly didn't, and they're trying to figure out what it means, what, what would, would it be the most reasonable thing for them to have done? Ask. Jesus, what do you mean by leaven of the Pharisees? We don't have any idea. But because they're already feeling their failure, they already know they've blown it. It seems that they are, are, are viewing this as Jesus rebuking them for forgetting bread. They're keep looking at this entirely on a human plane. We forgot the bread. Jesus here is now saying, look, right, you forgot bread. Make sure you don't buy any from the, scribes, from the Pharisees and Sadducees or, or something along those lines. A totally physical understanding of the problem. We made a physical problem. We blew it by not bringing bread. And now he's pointing out the danger somehow of getting bread from the Pharisees and Sadducees, or, or he's just tweaking us because we didn't bring the bread. Who knows? They're totally focused on the physical, which was constantly the problem. And they don't take the time in their own pride, I think, to not even ask Jesus what he means. They kind of huddle together. We know that they weren't talking to Jesus because in a minute he's going to say he was aware. He, wasn't, he didn't hear them. He was just aware of what they were talking about. Not because he overheard it, but because he knew he was God. The Spirit revealed this to him. Right, so they're saying, he said that because we didn't bring any bread. So he's coming after us. We didn't bring bread. He wants to make sure we don't get bread from the wrong place, maybe, or, or possibly just, you know, he's, he's, he's pointing out to us that we didn't bring bread and that we should have. And so he's, you know, he's trying to point out our mistake. They're making an assumption about what Jesus means. Now, I mean, to, to, the, to the disciples' defense, Jesus said a lot of things that were really hard to understand. So there's, not, there's no shame in not knowing what Jesus meant. I mean, there's a lot of times when you're like, you read it, and you're like, I don't know what he meant. You even see the context, context and we're unsure. But they should have just asked. They should have gone to him and said, Jesus, what do you mean? And so now the disciples are rebuked. It says, Jesus, aware of this. And I don't, I don't think it means that he heard this. They're kind of off to the side talking about, oh, man, he's coming after us for not having bread. He's telling us, you know, maybe not to go to the Pharisees and Sadducees for, for bread. The, the leaven of their bread might, might be defiled. Who knows? I mean, it's hard to know exactly what's going on here. But, but they're rebuked. Jesus knew their discussion. Guys, can I just remind you of this? 
Why don't you just run to Jesus when you have questions or problems or, or you're wrestling with things? Because he already knows. It wasn't like Jesus is just aware here of the disciples. God is aware of what's going on in your heart. He knows your wrestles, knows your struggles, knows the, the questions that you have. Why don't you humbly get on your knees and come to him and say, God, I don't understand. And then run to his word that he might instruct you in the things that you need to understand. He's not going to answer all your questions and, and work everything out for you and say, look, I did this and this and this, and let me show you. the." He's not going to do that, but he will always in his word, give you the truth you need to understand enough about your situation to please him in it. That's what he will do always. Just run to him the first time. Confused and frustrated about your marriage, wrestling with being a parent, wrestling with being a child, wondering how to conduct yourself in your workplace, struggling with, with friendships that don't seem to be going well. Run to the Lord. He already knows. He's aware of it. And he cares for you. We've already seen that over and over. It's not just aware of it. Like, I can't believe they're wrestling again. I can't believe they're frustrated again. I can't believe they don't understand this. Foolish people, I'm done with them. No, foolish people, I love them. And he'll point out your foolishness, by the way. He's not afraid to do that at all. He does it with the disciples all the time. He'll be happy to point it out, but he'll always come alongside and care for you in the midst of it and provide you with what you need to know. So just go to him. John 2, 24 says, Jesus knew all men. He didn't need anyone to testify concerning man, for he knew what was in them. Hebrews 4.13, no creature is hidden from his sight. All things are open and laid bare to the eyes with, of him with whom we have to do. You guys, he knows everything you're thinking. Now, that can be negative, I guess. It may be convicting. I could preach that side, which is he knows everything you're thinking. He knows all that's going on in your mind. You better watch out. Well, that, that's true. <laughs> that he judges us for every, there will be a judgment for every thought and, and every motive. That's on the negative side. But I'd like you to think about that positively this morning. Every time, on the negative side, every time you try to present to people, you know, how good you were and you really were sinful inside, God knew that even if the people didn't. But on the flip side of that, Every time you tried to serve people and love them and honor them and they didn't view it as that and they thought you were something that you weren't, God knows that too. And whether the people ever figure it out or whether they ever recognize that you truly were sincere, as, as sincere and as, as truthful as a human being can be, guys, God knows it and you don't have to try to get it from people. He knows and he understands when you wanted to serve him. And as a believer, much of what you do, much of our time is spent doing what? Wanting to serve the Lord. He never forgets or overlooks a single thought that was pleasing to him. And as a Christian, you think hundreds of those every day. You desire him. You want to love him. You want to read his word. Even when you fail, you want to pray to him. You want to love your kids. You want to love your spouse. You want to do well at work. Because you want to do all those things. That's your desire. He knows every one of them. He credits them to you, as it were, in Christ. They're, they're Christ's, but he remembers and he blesses and strengthens you. Guys, Romans 8, 26 ought to be such a blessing to us. It says, in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. Because we don't even know how to pray right. I mean, you ever get down, you want to pray for something like, I don't even know what to say. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't know Scripture. We shouldn't pray scripturally according to scriptural principles and according to the will of God. We should but there are times when we're just like, I just don't know what to do here. I don't even know how to express this. It says, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts, that's God. He searches the hearts. He knows what the mind of the Spirit is. That is, the Spirit of God really interpreting what's going on inside your own heart to the God who searches our hearts. It says, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. For the believer, God knows everything going on inside of you. And, and, and through the spirit of God, literally interpreting for you, he's hearing your prayers, responding to your needs, caring for you and your failures. He knows all of that. Don't hide it from him. Don't, don't, don't in your selfishness and foolishness, even when you fail, somehow separate yourself out, talking in your little groups while the God of the universe is saying, I already know that. Why don't you just come to me? Why don't you just ask? Why don't you just work through that? I, I know who you are. Respond to me. Have faith in me. Believe in me. Because what Jesus rebukes them for is what? A lack of faith. This is fascinating here. Right? He rebukes them for not having faith. Well, well how is that? Right? So Jesus is aware of this, and he rebukes them for the lack of faith. First, he knew their discussion. 
Okay, so this is, the disciples are rebuked. Jesus knew their discussion. Jesus rebuked their lack of faith. He says, why are you discussing bread? You men of little faith. That's his adjective for them. You little faiths. That was kind of his pit nickname for the disciples. What a name, little faith. Right? I put that on your, you know, put that on your nameplate at, at, at work. You know, Chris, little faith. That's who we are oftentimes. And he's constantly rebuking them for this. All right? So he said, you men of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves that you have no bread? In this case, their, their faith was that they weren't, one, trusting in God for his provision, but two, they weren't understanding things spiritually. They weren't viewing things by faith. They were viewing them according to what they could touch and what they could taste. Always we do that. Everything for us is like, what can I touch? What can I see? How can I, how can I view it rather than living by faith according to the principles of the word of God? That was their wrestle. We don't have bread. He's rebuking us for not having bread. He's telling us that the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees have bad bread. No, they weren't understanding things spiritually, which isn't mystically or, or, or uh, you know, that doesn't exist. It's the truth of life as it's understood through the principles of scripture. That's spiritual. And by faith, you understand then how to respond to every situation. They're failing miserably. It's not just that they're not trusting God for provision. They're not viewing life by faith. They're viewing it by what they can see. And we respond then on what we can see. Well, I don't like that, so I'm going to respond this way. And I don't like that you did that, so I'm going to respond this way. And I don't like that God did this, so I'm going to respond this way. Everything by what we see which is what the disciples are doing, and not by faith. He says, why are you talking about bread? And, and number three here, then Jesus calls for their remembrance. Don't you remember the five loaves of the 5,000? And that you had plenty of bread left over? Don't you remember the seven loaves of the 4,000? Remember, two separate incidents. Not one, as the liberals will tell you. you know, Matthew had to get this in twice, so he just changed it a little bit and gave you another one. Ridiculous. Two events, separate events. Both times the disciples were clueless, and now a third time they're still clueless. And worrying about bread, he's like, look, I can provide you bread. I think that's the first point here. Yeah, you, you know, Philip's there holding the, whoever, holding the one loaf. So look, you don't need to worry about eating because I just took care of, you know, 25,000 people in those two incidents, and you had leftovers both times. So stop worrying about the bread. But bigger picture, view things spiritually. View them by faith. View this whole situation according to what is really necessary. And what he's telling them is what's really necessary is not that you have more bread or that you somehow remember to bring it. What's necessary is that you don't get drawn astray by false teaching. You're in great danger, he's telling the, telling the disciples in the situation, not because you're hungry, but because you're spiritually vulnerable. And they didn't view that at all. They thought they were hungry. We don't have bread. He's getting on us for bread. And, and somehow if we get stuff from the Pharisees, their bread will taint us. Well, they knew better than that. They should have. It's not the bread of the Pharisees that was the problem if, if there is such a thing. It's not their physical. It's not they're going to be physically tainted by getting something from the Pharisees or from the world. Please remember that. And some of you are going to get some physical thing from the world and that's going to taint you. You're going to buy something from Walmart. That's not the problem. The problem is going on in your heart. The problem is the teaching that goes along with the things that you have and the things that you see. What the world is proclaiming in the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, that's the problem. You can boycott stuff all day long, but if you don't turn away from the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life, you have done no good whatsoever. None. Physical things don't taint you. Spiritual things do. What people teach, what they say, what they tell you is important, that's what taints you, and that's what he's saying. Enough with the bread. In fact, in, in Mark, he, he really comes after him. It's really strong. He says, having eyes do you not see? Having ears do you not hear? Uh, holy frustration. Right? Where he's like, you're just not getting it. It's not about the bread. It's about the teaching. It's going to kill you if you believe it. Stop. See things by faith. That is through the principles of Scripture. View and understand my provision, but more importantly, understand that you need to view every situation in light of my teaching and be careful that you're not drawn astray. Guys, this is so true for us. How often do you get caught up in the physical nature of things and you don't understand the spiritual dangers that are lurking right outside your door and you respond wrong physically because you're not viewing things spiritually by faith and you get crushed spiritually? Even if everything works out physically, you learned nothing. You did not grow because you didn't respond in faith. Guys, this happens to us all the time. And it happened to the disciples all the time. He constantly is trying to tell them, no, it's about, it's about what you view by faith. It's about what you know about the truth of my teaching, not about what you can see with your eyes. 
Let's not misunderstand our situations because we are refusing to view things spiritually or view them by faith according to the principles of the word of God. Now, blessedly here, right? So Jesus corrected their misunderstanding. That was number four. He says, do not understand. Now, what's fascinating here is he goes, look, I'm not speaking to you concerning bread, but beware of the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees. He doesn't change his metaphor at all. He doesn't even say, beware of, oh, did I forget to tell you, beware of the teaching. No, he says, look, it's not about bread. And he goes back to his metaphor which is beware of the leaven. So, okay, now that he's removed the idea of bread, they can properly understand the metaphor. Okay, can't be about their bread. So now they get it. He explains it to them and they understand. They actually are discerning. The disciples here are discerning. The warning wasn't about leaven. They understood that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, some physical thing that might harm them or defile them in some way. And because they forgot their bread, they were in danger. No, they weren't living by faith, and so they were in danger. They were in danger of believing wrong teaching. That's why they were in danger, not some physical danger from Pharisees and Sadducees and the bread they might have to partake of because they forgot their own. The warning was about false teaching. Now, just a a moment here on some of the specific dangers of the Pharisees and Sadducees false teaching. Now, we're going to hit this in detail in Matthew chapter 23. So I'm just going to mention a couple of these, and then I'm going to finish out by, by maybe helping us realize when we're most vulnerable to this. All right, so just a couple of thoughts here on the specific dangers. Uh, th- this leaven was the leaven of liberalism. That is the Sadducees, Acts 23, 8, said there's no resurrection, no angels, no spirits, said, look, you can take the Bible. They believed in the Torah, the first five books, but remove the spiritual from it. I mean, where have you heard that? Every liberal commentary written since the turn of the century says exactly that. Like they're coming up with something new. Oh, we got something new. The Sadducees beat you to it. And Jesus rebuked them before he rebuked you. Lest you think this is not a big deal. I still run into churches and into people who are getting people from seminaries and sticking them in in their teaching positions that do not fully believe in the inerrancy, sufficiency, and authority of the Old Testament or the New. You are done if that's the case. Done. Your church will not last 10 years. Maybe 10, not, not more than 20. Your seminary won't last. Your school won't last. The moment there's a crack of liberalism in that door, you are done. Because the word of God is inerrant, authoritative, infallible, sufficient. And if you don't believe that, you will stop believing in true biblical Christianity in one generation. It has been proven over and over. Unless God does some amazing miracle and reverses the course of events and reverses your thinking about the Bible. It's not going to reverse it unless you think differently about the Bible. The leaven of naturalism, the leaven of hypocrisy. That is, they said one thing and they did entirely another. That's a tremendously dangerous little bit of leaven. Are you doing that here this morning? You look one way on the outside, you're acting another way underneath that, another way at work, another way at school, another way with your friends. You're killing the church. You're killing everybody around you when you do that. The Pharisees did that. They looked one way and everybody believed them. And then when they caught a glimpse underneath to see what was really there, they were shocked. And their own faith was crushed. That's the way it's going to be if, if that's what you're portraying to people. Look who we are. Look what we do. And then they get a little view underneath that. When well, they say, church is full of hypocrites, and they walk out the door. Of course, they're still a hypocrite. But nonetheless, they shouldn't be able to point to ours. The leaven of arrogant self-righteousness, Matthew 23, 5, they do their deeds to be noticed by men. No, nobody's going to be blessed by this church if we're full of arrogant self-righteousness. Not a single person. Look how good we are. Look what we can do. It's all about Christ. What do we just sing? All glory be to Christ. You ought to know more. You ought to love more. You ought to read more. You ought to memorize more. But that ought to all be for the glory of Christ. And everybody ought to know it. By your gentleness, by your love, by your grace, and by constantly pointing to him. That was their leaven. It's arrogant self-righteousness. The leaven of power and influence, Matthew 23, 6. They love the place of honor at banquets, chief seats in the synagogues. They want to look good and have power and position. The leaven of damning doctrine, Matthew 23, 13. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people. You teach, you can enter through doing the traditions of men. So these are some of the leaven. That is a few of the, of the leavening aspects of, of the Pharisees' teaching. Well, you might be thinking, okay, how, how, would that, how, how would we ever fall prey to that? Well, again, I would say, if you are viewing anything apart from the truths of scripture, which is not viewing it by faith, then you are in danger, deadly danger. Anything in your life that is not viewed according to these principles will be twisted by the evil one to harm you and by your sinful flesh. 
But how are we most o often open to false teachers? So by way of application, perhaps, and you can write some of these down if you want. If you are in these particular circumstances, you are going to be open to false teaching. One would be theological ignorance. When you're ignorant of scriptural principles, you become easy prey for false teachers. That is why here at Grace, we teach you over and over and over, starting with our little children, up through our youth group, into our older adults, into our seniors, everywhere. What? Principle, 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 principle. Why? Because if you don't know the truth, you will be led astray. Not, not could be, will be led astray into false teaching in that area in which you are ignorant. There's nothing that we can overlook, nothing that we should ignore when it comes to teaching because the evil one will twist it into some harmful thing for you. We will continue to do this until this church closes its doors, which we hope it never will. Because you have to know the truth. Theological ignorance will destroy your witness or destroy your faith if it wasn't real. Theological familiarity leads to false teaching. That is, we've been taught certain wrong things all our lives. We have a hard time unlearning those things. Because you're gonna have to let go of some things. Sometimes you come to grace or other places and, and you hear something that's new. You're like, I didn't, I, I didn't learn that when I, was, when I was growing up. We need to look into scripture. If it's real and you can be convinced scripturally, which we will work our best to do, you need to change. Now, you don't just come and say, well, you know, I'm gonna stay the same and I'd love to partake of the church, but I'm never gonna change my views on anything because these are the views I hold. You need to be convinced by scripture. If you're wrong, you need to change. We as elders, as we, as we look through and continually wrestle through scripture, if we're presented with scriptural things and say, look, this is the reality and we believe something wrongly, we have to change. That's what everyone has to do. Please do not come. Then we say, oh, you can't touch me. I, lo I love the church, but I'm gonna believe what I believe. If you are convinced from scripture that you are wrong, you need to change or you are in danger of going into error in that particular area. Theological familiarity. Third one might be cultural relevance. If we long to be comfortable in our culture, we will fall prey to false teachers who teach us how to be comfortable. My young people, my millennials, may I call you that for a moment in non-pejorative terms. So desirous of wanting to reach your culture, which is really good. So desirous, unfortunately, of wanting to look like your culture, which is really bad. And you've got all kinds of teachers out there who will look just like your culture. And it will show you and teach you seemingly how you can look more and be more like culture. It's going to kill you. And if that's what you want, you're going to grab false teaching and you're going to end up down the road. You should want to reach your generation. But you don't reach your generation by looking like it. You reach it by teaching the truth as you stand against what it holds to be dear. Cultural relevance will kill you. Personal preference. We all have personal goals or desires. We want to be rich, have certain kinds of relationships. We want to listen to those who will give us license to do those things. Your desires have a certain relationship here this morning. Can't get it. Your parents don't want it or someone else. You'll find someone who will give it to you. And you will end up in wrong teaching as a result. Personal influence. If you fall underneath, if you're easily influenced by extremely charismatic personalities, are you practicing that? Someone shows up in the music world, wow, those guys are awesome, I like the music. Man, hairstyle looks good, they look great. If you are influenced in that way, you are asking for trouble. If you're set up to be influenced by those who appear to be good and, and, and are charismatic in personality and, and look all great, and those are the people that you follow, you're being set up to, to believe a false teacher. It's what they say that matters, not how they look. Now, I shouldn't have to say that, but so often we're influenced by how they look. It's amazing you can have a whole evangelical movement on male hairstyles. Personal weaknesses, your, personal, your personality predisposes you to certain kinds of desires and outcomes. False teachings will exploit those weaknesses. Your personality is not a sin, but it predisposes you to, to, to certain kinds of sins and you will lean in those directions. You have to lean away from your personality. You have to lean according to the truths of scripture through your personality. Watch out for those that play on certain personality types and have cults of following around that. It will kill you. You can't respond, no, that's my personality. That's who I am. That'll kill you. It has to be the truth. You will be open to false teaching when you have sinful predispositions. That is, you simply are seeking to satisfy your flesh. <clears throat> Next one, just two more. You will, be, you will be open to false teaching when you love biblical novelty. That is, we tend to love things that are new, different, deeper, secret. False teachers rant against the mundane. Go on the internet. Yeah, when I know they taught you that, and I taught you that, that's all fine. Let me show you this. Turn it off. Run away. Biblical novelty will kill you. And then the last one, if you want to be open to false teachers, then be spiritually indifferent. 
be spiritually lukewarm. It is at that point that you are most vulnerable to someone who with, who with passion and with power, because believe me, false teachers are, are, are influential for a reason. They strongly believe or they want you to strongly believe what they do. And so they'll come and they'll snatch you out of that lukewarmness and they'll say, well, that's boring for you. Let me show you something better. You sit here Sunday after Sunday, bored to death, which I hope that you never do, but it's like, oh, here, I gotta be here again. Someone is gonna come and snatch you out of that indifference and point you and say, do this, this thing that isn't pleasing to the Lord. The disciples, Jesus Jesus looked at their lives, knowing their hearts, and he knew they were vulnerable because they weren't living by faith. They were living according to what they could see, the failures that they made, the, the, what they could touch. He said, no, you are of little faith. Understand that I can f- provide physical things. You need to view things spiritually so that you understand how to respond biblically so that you aren't drawn away by the false teaching that he knew was tugging at their hearts. What might it be for you this morning? What might be tugging there that that the Lord knows? Respond by faith that you might walk in strength in the one who has all the power. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you for these truths of scripture. Thank you for your protection of your your disciples, your care for them to, to direct them away from the things that would spiritually ruin them. And I pray that you would help us this morning to perhaps step back from the brink of things that might be harmful to us and to walk and to live and to react and to respond always by faith according to the principles of your word and the power of your spirit. In your precious name, Lord Jesus.